So welcome today to um, understanding Southeast Asia through food, or recreating Southeast Asia through food. Um, for which we have four distinguished panelists who are going to talk to us about their experiences uh, attempting to recreate uh, a sort of a, a sense of an authentic Southeast Asian culinary experience here in London. Um, yeah, I suppose it's, it's something that is quite an industry for, isn't there? Constantly searching for this real Southeast Asia, especially here in London. It's, it's going to be, I think, a very interesting discussion. So we're going to start off with Andy Spracklin. Um, and then, oh no, sorry, but some. <laughs> Um, also known as Mr. Noodles. Um, and I'll allow him to kind of tell you himself about what it is he does. I'll stop to. Hi, Ting, do we want to stay there? Or? Okay. So, my name's uh, Sung, uh, also known as Mr. Noodles in my, in my blogging name. I, I feel I ought to be wearing a cape and have a uni uh, have an outfit, but that would be a little bit weird, to be, uh, to be honest. Um, so, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad you could make it. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank Cormac for inviting me to, uh, to the event today. And um, it's a pleasure to be on this uh, esteemed panel. Um, I feel a bit of a, bit of a charlatan compared to these guys, entrepreneur, restaurateur, cookbook writer. I do, I'm just a humble blogger and, and one that doesn't really blog. Uh, that much nowadays. So anyway, I must admit when I was first asked to do this, I was a little bit nervous of, as to what I was going to talk about and, and, and what, what to discuss. So it's strange how you get inspiration. So I was just walking around the local supermarket and I thought, well, I'll, I'll have a go at trying to find some uh, ingredients, a typical Southeast Asian ingredients in the supermarket and see how easily I could uh, find them. And, and to my surprise, I, 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 it was very easy. <laughs> Exhibit A, uh, tin of spam. <laughs> Exhibit B, some macaroni. Actually, this was quite hard to find because um, I went to a Sainsbury's at first and I couldn't find any macaroni at all. It was penne everywhere, no macaroni. Is that whole wheat penne, gluten-free penne, organic penne? I never realised there were so many different types of penne. Macaroni, obviously, is not posh enough for Sainsbury's. I ended up in Morrison's before I could find the macaroni. Now, I know what you're thinking. This isn't, is this really authentic Southeast Asian food? It's spam and macaroni. It's like I'm an American survivalist or, or uh, um, really sad kind of eater, but this is Southeast Asian food. It's what many people um, eat and cook as part of their everyday lives in, in, in Asia. Spam is popular, very popular in the Philippines, I understand. Um, so much so a few years ago when there was a typhoon there, the, uh, the makers of Spam, they, they airlifted in box, boxes of the stuff as part of a uh, humanitarian mission. Macaroni, again, very, very popular. In Hong Kong, they, they merged the two and make them into breakfast. But macaroni also, I've come across this in Thailand where there's a, there's a dish. When I first saw it, they, they, they made an attempt at writing it in English as well as in Thai, because obviously I can't read Thai. And I was, pad macaroni, with the macaroni written out kind of syllable by syllable. And I said, oh, what the hell is that? And then I saw a picture, macaroni, stir fried it. I didn't order it, by the way, because I thought, well, I went to the next door. Uh, but apparently it's made with that like, tomato ketchup, some chili sauce, and, and, and they stir fry the macaroni in with, well, there might be even be some spam in there. I, I really don't know. But macaroni is Southeast Asian as is spam. I think the point I'm trying to, uh, to get across is that authenticity isn't always what you, you think it is. It's, it's, I guess, I, I, what I'm trying to say is authenticity is in the eye of the beholder. It's, 
It's not what you or me tells, tell people is, is authentic. It's what people live. It's how they experience it. And I think Spam and Macaroni in that case are authentic Southeast Asian foods. So I'll put these to one side now. Anyone wants these, they're, they're more than welcome to have them. I don't actually like them, to be honest. <laughs> Bad Asian. But in terms of other um, foods, that, th th there is this kind of thought process that other foods are more authentic because when you think of Southeast Asian food, you don't think of Spam and Macaroni, obviously. You think of uh, vibrant salads made with exotic and exotic fruits like papaya and mango uh, with dressed with fish sauce and lime juice and dried shrimp and, and all that kind of thing, banana blossoms. And for many people, that's what authentic Southeast Asian food is. And of course that is, as is this. And I guess some of that stuff's easy. It's, it's quite harder to find in a supermarket than, than, than spam and macaroni, although nowadays it's, it's increasingly easier. And I think when it comes to authenticity, there is, this, there is this danger of being a little bit holier than thou about, um, about what, food is or, what food is authentically Southeast Asian and what isn't. A, a friend of mine, a few weeks ago, I was walking with him, we were just going through town and we walked past a barn me shop. Uh, and, and also in this barn me shop, uh, the, they also had the little subtitle, Vietnamese Baguette. And this guy, he's, he's actually, a, um, he, he's a European guy, he's an Italian guy, and actually started getting a little bit shaky fist. He was going like, Vietnamese baguette? Vietnamese baguette, I'm not. If I want Vietnamese food, I will have Vietnamese food. I'm not gonna eat a baguette. But I said to him, no, don't, don't be, what are you going on about? And he's going, well, it's, uh, it's fusion, I'm, I'm not eating that. It's going, well, actually, people in Vietnam, that's what they eat. They, they eat baguettes. It's, it's their food. Just because you think it's not their food doesn't mean it's not their food and it doesn't mean it's not authentic. And the other, the other one that, that really, uh, that, that also springs to mind in the debate about authenticity, and uh, this was a few years ago now, I was in a Thai restaurant and next to me in the adjacent table there was a, a couple and um, the guy, I think he was trying to impress his lady friend and uh, he, um, he asked the waitress for some chopsticks and I was thinking, well, I wanted to, obviously I think he just wanted to show off and uh, the Thai are very polite people. I would have said, look, you're not getting chopsticks, use your spoon and fork, but, you know, obviously that's why I'm not in the hospitality trade. <laughs> and she dutifully brought him over some chopsticks, and he started, oh, I don't know why they gave me just a spoon and fork. And I was thinking, oh. I was trying to keep calm at this point. I was going, because you didn't order soup noodles. The only time Thai people use chopsticks are with soup noodles. Don't be an idiot. But I didn't say that. And I think, again, it's this kind of mindset sometimes where people are looking for um, like this uber authenticity that isn't really, isn't really there. And I think that, that, that kind of mindset, I think sometimes restaurateurs and high street supermarkets and chains, they sometimes prey on this uh, exoticism. And they do come up with some kind of odd things that they label up as being from Bangkok or Hanoi or, 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 or from wherever and, and they, they mix in all kinds of weird and wonderful things and they put some kind of Thai script on there to make it look authentic when it's far from. And I think sometimes that's, uh, that's a problem that I, I find more than spam and macaroni to be honest. It's, it's this kind of fake authentic food that sometimes that, that bothers me the, 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 the most. I don't, I don't care that they've made it. Uh, and in some cases it might even be very tasty. It's the, it's the fact that they, 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 they try to pretend it's authentic when it's, when it's not. And they 
sometimes they, they make some missteps, but that when it comes to authenticity, that's the thing that, that only bothers me so much because at the end of the day, I, I, I don't really care what people eat. They can eat their spam and macaroni and they can eat their salads, they can eat their wonderful food, but if it isn't real, don't pretend it's, it's, it's real. But, and on that note, that's, that's the end of my little, little speech, my little spiel there. And uh, thank you for, for turning up at this ungodly hour on a Sunday morning to listen to, to me speak. And thank you. Thanks, Sam, for that. A uh, really thank good you. introduction, I think, to the <coughs> core issues that we want to discuss today. Um, and I guess none of us will ever look at spam in quite the same way. Um, maybe we won't be making pad macaroni, but... Um, next, we're going to hear from Andy Spracklin, who's a restaurateur, Malaysian food entrepreneur, um, and also MA Anthropology of Food student here at SOAS. Thank you. Thank you, Cormac. Um, good morning. Yes, thank you for turning up for Sunday morning. I hope we can get a, a really interesting debate going later. And how can I follow spam? I, I, I don't know. Um, but the, uh, certainly the issues of authenticity um, matter um, greatly, I think, in the debate about recreating Southeast Asian food. And um, I think also it's also about the power of food um, to engage um, people in a culture. Um, there's no other um, uh, emblem or, or object, if you like, um, or marker than food um, when it comes to, to culture, whether or not it's the sort of everyday um, food that people um, are eating at home or whether it's um, the more emblematic um, signature dishes um, of a cuisine that um, people are um, more likely to be striving for um, and looking for here in, in London and the UK. Um, my experience, as Cormac says, has been through um, a restaurant called Ning in um, Manchester, actually, um, which um, uh, presented itself a lot of issues when we set it up um, nine years ago. I say we, um, until very recently, I was working closely with chef Norman Musa, who's um, a Malaysian chef, um, and um, you may have come across him at food festivals and so on. Um, but essentially, um, introducing Malaysian cuisine, which nine years ago was still pretty um, rare, um, certainly in Manchester, um, to a relatively conservative kind of eating population um, of Manchester was, was, was a challenge. Um, and um, I'm, I'm actually not going on my notes at all here, <laughs> to a large degree. Um, but it was about um, connecting into, peop into people's kind of perceptions of what Malaysian food was. And for us, a lot of it um, was about, um, uh, yes, I mean, authenticity was an issue. Um, if anything, being so-called too authentic um, in the cuisine was actually a barrier to a lot of customers. Um, Malaysian food, um, if, you, if you're familiar with it, is certainly, along with Singaporean cuisine, um, I, I believe the tastiest, most diverse cuisine in the world. And if you haven't tried it, then you really seriously must. Um, but it, as a result, it's also quite tricky to pin down as to what it is. And so, again, you get into issues of authenticity because um, arguably it's one of the most hybrid cuisines in the world, along with many other um, cuisines. There's so much hybridity um, that has built up over time. And indeed, much of what Malaysia um, purports to be their cuisine, rendang, for example, being a classic example, is fought against vehemently by the Indonesians who quite rightly um, say that it um, originated from Sumatra. Um, so, so you get into all these kind of um, issues as to um, who is it authentic to, who is it authentic for, um, who is it authentic by, and in the past, you know, are we talking about authentic now, are we talking about authentic in the, par you know, in the past? 
Um, what do we mean by it? Um, are we talking about the authenticity of the ingredients that are going into it, which of course is very difficult um, in many parts of the UK. Certainly, I mean, things have changed dramatically um, more recently. I mean, you can pick up all sorts of ingredients now in your local Tesco or Morrisons. Um, but, but equally, um, it, there are still those kind of authentic ingredients, like, for example, uh, um, I, I can never remember the exact um, name of it, but uh, you know, the, the leaves you use in Alaxa, um, or um, taut ginger, ginger flour that's used a lot as well. Um, very, very difficult to get hold of in the UK, so you have to make substitutions um, when you're um, um, uh, create, recreating some of this cuisine. So to some degree, there is a de um, you, you end up, um, certainly in my experience, um, of creating more authenticity, authenticity around the experience um, rather than being um, hard and fast about exactly the recipes. Um, again, issues of, of how spicy do you make it, for example. Many people in the UK um, find it very difficult to have something that's as spicy as you might have back home. And yet, we then get issues with guests who then come back from Malaysia and say, oh, this isn't as spicy as it was when we were out there, or this isn't quite right, and so on. So, it, authenticity ends up being a very kind of ambiguous, um, uh, kind of almost kind of in-between state. And, and I think that's when you end up with um, the notions of um, liminality. And, and in a way, when you're um, in a restaurant, I realise that as I've been studying anthropology um, in the last year or so, is that actually a restaurant is quite a liminal space. You know, you're, it's not, you know, yes, we're a Malaysian restaurant, but we're not in Malaysia. We're not. Um, um, you know, we, we try to make it as authentic as possible, um, but playing to um, the fact that it needs to be commercially viable, it needs to be attractive to as many local customers as possible. And so issues of um, the staff that we have, um, little design touches, um, how the menu's presented, how it's described, the branding, the knowledge that the staff have, um, is all um, valid and important in terms of creating authenticity, um, which um, you could argue, as um, I think it's um, McCannell who wrote about the tourist, um, calls staged authenticity. Um, and, and to some degree you have to do that because that's what people are looking for. Um, another key thing that we've um, experienced is, is actually engaging people. To me, this is the most important thing in terms of recreating Southeast Asian cuisine, or indeed any cuisine, to another culture or cultures, is, is how you engage with people. Um, after all, food being the most powerful, um, um, if you like, medium, <coughs> of engaging with people because it, it brings together um, all the senses. Um, it's something that we we um, come back with in our memories, don't we, when we've been overseas. You know, you want to kind of recreate that to some degree. So, so um, engaging people, and, and we found that by running cookery classes in Malaysian cuisine was a fantastic way of educating people. Um, and over time, people become more and more aware of what is authentic and what is not authentic. Um, and I, um, together with uh, my former business partner, Chef Norman um, <coughs> Musa, um, we got heavily involved in the Malaysia Kitchen campaign, which is one of the foremost um, so-called gastro-diplomacy campaigns, um, or you know, it's kind of nation branding through food, um, Campaigns. You may be familiar. Some of you may have been to Trafalgar Square's Malaysia Night. Um, you know that is run by the, you know, and funded to a large degree by the Malaysian government to promote um, their country through um, through food. And given the fact that all Malaysians and Singaporeans love their food so much. You know, there's, there's all Malaysians and Singaporeans are foodies. I, I'm kind of bringing Singaporeans in because um, Shu is here, and, um, and and also because of course it has a shared history in terms of its cuisine. Um, so so bringing you know food has this kind of wonderful power of bringing people together, 
winning people over, if you like, through their stomachs. Um, but there's a lot of debate, I think, um, to be had, and I'm not going to go into the details now, but maybe if it's of interest to people here, um, is really how you go about that. And, um, you know, some might argue that the Malaysia Kitchen campaign um, has kind of diluted the authenticity of Malaysian cuisine. You know, part of their strategy has to appeal to mass consumer markets, not just kind of the foodies, the adventurous, um, the ones who kind of are open-minded about different cultures. But, you know, you even find um, now, I, I remember seeing a, um, a laxa sandwich um, in Tesco's. Um, you, I even, and it goes further, my local trendy hipster hackney um, brewery, um, uh, craft brewery, pub, bar, pizzeria thing, um, even came up with a laxa pizza. Now, don't tell me. Thankfully, it wasn't sloppy. Um, but, um, but, you know, it, it's, it's how... The, 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 on the one hand, you can say, well, it's great that these kind of words, these vocabularies are getting in. You know, even um, Weatherspoons, I think it is now, um, serve up a rendang on their newest menu. Um, I think it's... I think it's them. Um, or it might be um, beef eater or something like that. But anyway, one of these kind of big chains, I think it's a whip bread chain, does a rendang, you know. And um, it, it's interesting how these kind of different cuisines, these different names come into our vocabulary. And they end up um, condensing um, and becoming, yes, they might become emblematic of what is Malaysian cuisine, just as a green curry has become emblematic of a Thai cuisine, but of course it's a lot, lot more than that, um, and so um, I think there's a lot of debate to be had, the pros and the cons of that, and I think again it all comes down to, you know, who who are you aiming for, what are you aiming, why, what is your objective in all of this, um, and in the case of the Malaysia Kitchen campaign, it has been to a large degree about. Um, trade. Um, it's actually interesting that originally Malaysia Kitchen was um, uh, officiated by uh, Tourism Malaysia, but unfortunately they did very little about it, and so ministers weren't very happy and they passed it to um, Mar Trade, who are the Malaysian Trade Commission, and so it ended up becoming much more about getting Malaysian products, food products, into supermarkets um, and into the psyche of um, the British people um, to, in, in, to raise um, imports and exports. Whereas when you look at the campaigns of Korea, South Korea and Thailand, um, and even I think to some degree Taiwan um, and um, Japan of course, a lot of that, a lot of their um, strategies has been about um, more, if you like, what could be termed gastro diplomacy, um, sort of engaging people in the culture of those, um, of those countries and, and, and raising um, the knowledge and awareness and the quantity of restaurants of those cuisines um, so that people then want to visit those countries and engage in those cultures and understand more about, about those cultures. So I won't say any more because there's a whole range of issues around you know, the power dynamics in all of this um, there's the issues, as I say, I think, um, particularly around, um, which interests me as well, which I forgot to say, actually, is that, is that my background is actually in urbanism. So for me, um, there's a whole new dimension, a whole really powerful extra dimension that comes in about place. And when you bring um, people, place, and cultural identity together, um, there is a very, very powerful medium, and of course, food brings those three elements together. Um, and I'm very looking forward to hearing um, um, Deborah's experience of, of shared city um, later um, to, to bring more of that into light. So, a few thoughts, and I'm happy to take questions as with everyone else later. Hopefully we'll hear more of your thoughts during the question and answer section. 
Um, yeah, and so next we've got Deborah Chatterjee who um, runs Shared City. Um, I'll let you tell, I'll let her tell you more about what exactly they do. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I feel like a charlatan and a bit of a phony being here because I'm certainly not an expert on Southeast Asia. Uh, but the organisation I run with my business partner, Caroline, who might be coming later, um, is, um, sorry, I've just recorded what I was going to say, yes. <laughs> um, so Shared City is running an event as a part of this festival. Uh, we've got a visit on Tuesday to the Islamic Cultural Centre, as um, Islam is obviously uh, uh, one of the major religions in Southeast Asia. Um, so I'm here for more generic reasons and I'm going to uh, pick up from where Andy left off about authenticity. Um, but first of all, I'll tell you a bit about Shared City. Um, so um, myself and Caroline, who I set Shared City up with, um, are, we're both Londoners, we're both from multicultural backgrounds and uh, we've both travelled the world and we realised that a lot of what we'd seen abroad um, we had on our doorstep um, and we also realised that when you ask people what they like about London a lot of people will say oh it's great it's so cosmopolitan it's so multicultural but actually their experience of multiculturalism might just boil down to um, buying their fruit and veg in a Turkish shop or going to an Indian restaurant and, and actually it, it stops there. Um, and my background is actually working with refugees and immigrants. Um, so I used to work as an ESOL teacher. Um, I've taught English in detention centres. And I think that was one of the inspirations of, uh, behind Shared City. Um, it was really trying to break down cultural barriers because um, even though London is very cosmopolitan, we still uh, uh, live in our little neighbourhoods and uh, don't mix as much as, as we should do. And it was really uh, trying to get one of the reasons be uh, behind it was to try and get people to understand and appreciate um, other cultures um, and for example um, uh, we uh, we've had various uh, tours to uh, to mosques and it's the first time that a lot of people who come on our tours have set foot in a mosque and they've been amazed and they've taken part in in q and a's and they found it really fascinating so anyway um Shared City's tagline is travel the world without leaving London um, and so we, we create little tours and we go to the heart of different communities in London where people learn about the food, culture, language and people um, and so it, it's like a, a little daycation, that, that's what we call it. Um, and we've even created passports for people that we stamp when they come on one of our trips. Um, and the challenge for us, actually, has been authenticity, uh, because first of all, um, all our guides um, are um, either uh, first or second generation immigrants, and it's very important that um, we have someone leading the tour who does understand uh, the community um, uh, for example we get people contacting us saying oh th this sounds great i've been living in london you know x amount of years but they don't necessarily belong to a particular community so we, we can't have generic guides who are just passionate about their city they have to belong to a particular community and while I'm on the subject, if any of you are from um, a particular communities in London and you'd be interested in taking people around your, your community and sharing it with other people, please speak to me um, after this. I'd be interested to, to find out more. 
Um, so, um, for example, I, I actually do lead um, the tour to Little Italy because I'm half Italian and grew up being part of the com uh, Italian community in London. Uh, Caroline's from a Jewish background, so she does the uh, tour of Jewish North London. Um, so that is an exception because we're both passionate about uh, our backgrounds. Um, I, I am actually half Indian as well, um, but because um, I was more immersed in the Italian community, I don't think I could give a good tour of the Indian community. And also it's very vast, you've got people from different parts of the uh, subcontinent. Um, and so the first uh, challenge for authenticity is finding a good guide. And then it's also finding an area that represents the community. Um, so for example, on our tour of Gujarati, India, uh, we go to Alperton and you come out of the tube station and it could be a mini Mumbai. Uh, it's really incredible, really vibrant. Um, whereas other communities are, are very spread out. There isn't really a particular area, and I think it might be the, the case with uh, Southeast Asia. So that, that, um, that's an area that we really want to start focusing on. So we've been researching Vietnam, and um, we're, we're talking with the um, Thai Buddhist temple in Wimbledon. I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's absolutely incredible. Um, and it, it's on a residential road. It's like the, the last place you'd expect to see this in, incredible temple. Um, and uh, the, the monks there uh, make a fabulous lunch every day. Um, and so that, uh, that can provide a, a, a really interesting tour because actually all our tours do revolve around uh, food um, and uh, picking up from what Andy and Sung said, that um, food seems to unite people and seems to get people out. Um, uh, people are always really interesting when we're offering lots of sort of tasty uh, uh, lunches on our on our tours. So we, we have different uh, tours. We have walking tours that um, include snacks. Um, and then there are options to, uh, to have lunch or to, to um, have cookery lessons. Uh, but yes, uh, finding an authentic place where people from the community uh, gather is very important. So that might be a community centre. There's a lot of activity that revolves around temples and churches. So for example, if, if I... Um, talk about the uh, Scandinavian uh, community in, in, in London, um, it's very spread out. <coughs> there isn't a Scandinavian part of, of, of London, but actually every Sunday, uh, lots of Scandinavians descend on Rotherhithe um, because you've got the Finnish church and the Norwegian church, and we, we've got to know uh, both churches and they invite Shared City to take part um, in, in their uh, church services and then have lunch with them. Um, we learn about the, the history of Scandinavians in London. Um, so that is very authentic because that is where Scandinavians go. The um, Swedish and Danish churches um, uh, near uh, Marlebo. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of authenticity, uh, some people might be put off uh, that um, part of the, the tour uh, might include sitting through a church service, but we think that's how you experience the real authenticity of the culture. Uh, so, for example, with our Little Italy tour, we go to the English-Italian Mass on a Sunday morning, but we give people the option to uh, join us uh, later if 
that, that they think they're in danger of foaming at the mouth sitting through the, uh, a, a church service. And we, we find that actually they, they, um, they, they miss out a lot um, just in terms of people watching and comparing it to other church services they might have been in and really experiencing the, the church at, at, at its best. So, um, yeah, the, the, the challenge is, is um, finding something that's authentic and actually being brave about it. We could easily just say, oh, well, uh, people might not want to, uh, uh, to, to, to visit a, a, a church or, or a mosque. They might just be interest in, interested in the food. Uh, but we want to go beyond that. We want them to mix with, uh, with people, um, learn a bit about the language, um, uh, um, yeah, just, just interact with people. And, and I think if, it, if, it, if the tour just focused on, on food, um, there are lots of, of food tours around, I think that would uh, limit the uh, cultural um, experience. Um, but uh, something that we have found, and I, I think it's, it's related to what the uh, previous panellists have said, is that um, authenticity isn't always what we think it is. I think because, because of the globalisation of food, um, people are eating <laughs> things that we don't associate uh, with that country. Uh, so, uh, for example, um, at, at the Norwegian church, uh, they always put on an amazing spread for us, a proper smorgasbord um, with beautiful homemade waffles, homemade jam, all the uh, wonderful open sandwiches. Um, but the, the first time we, we went, went there, we'd spoken to them and they said, oh, we always have a Norwegian lunch. Uh, the, the first time we had a tour there, I checked the menu with them and they said, oh yes, we've got special guests, uh, so we're making lasagna. And I said, oh, okay, oh, that, that, that's not very Norwegian. And they said, but that's what we eat in Norway, we eat lasagna and we like it. And, and they were very nice, they, they went out of their way to, to make a special lunch for us and, and they did warn us that people might be a bit jealous, um, even though obviously lasagna is a, po a popular dish, but I found that really interesting that we have this idea of what other people eat and that um, I, th I think there's a lot of disappointment uh, so, uh, sometimes because we've been brainwashed to um, thinking that um, a, a lot of dishes are typical of that country and that's what people eat every day. Um, I, I suppose the only uh, uh, country that I've, I've found that um, people really live up to the sort of stereotype I'd say is Italy and I think that's because regionalism is still very strong uh, in the country. It only became uh, a country in 1871. So regional <coughs> cooking is still really, really important. And, and as a nation, they're very wary of uh, uh, foreign food. I think that, that, that's changing in the more uh, cosmopolitan cities like Milan. But I think if you ask an Italian, uh, uh, nothing can top uh, Italian food. But for example, um, on our Brazil tour, um, we... Uh, go to this uh, amazing uh, Brazilian uh, hostel uh, that's run by uh, a Brazilian pastor and his mum does all the uh, home cooking and uh, we, we have a buffet there. And um, I asked him if his mum could make feijoada, which is the Brazilian national dish. It's, it's rice and beans and it has these sort of uh, bread crumbs on top, it looks a bit like sawdust, but anyway, it's very, very tasty. Um, and uh, and he, he, he said, uh, yeah, okay, but he, he, 
he kind of didn't he didn't convince me he was going to <laughs> to get his mum uh, to make that. Um, and uh, in, in the end, she, she, she made another uh, uh, dish. And um, I, I said, oh, I was really hoping that we'd have the feijoada. And he said, but we don't eat feijoada all, all the time. You know, we eat things like this. And um, I think for, uh, for us, that's been challenging because maybe people come along to uh, uh, our tours uh, what, uh, wanting to ex wanting to experience something authentic, but actually it, expecting maybe being slightly um, uh, how can, how can I put it yeah ju just expecting the sort of stereotypical uh, uh, dishes and maybe the uh, the standard that you'd uh, get in, in in restaurants, but a lot of the time it's it's home cooked food. It's what people are eating every day, and I've realised that it's probably the equivalent of um, uh, your tour taking place about uh, Great Britain and a request uh, being put in for steak and kidney uh, pie and, and and roast beef. And um, we, we know that we've got uh, so much more in our, you know, uh, in our culinary uh, range. Um, so, um, yeah, the point I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make is that it's not always what you expect. And actually, uh, on our Italy tour, we go to the um, uh, Italian social club that, that's linked to the church. And it's great, it's like being in a little village in Italy um, after the church service, all the uh, um, men are playing cards, drinking grappa with their espresso, uh, the uh, Italian news is on in the background, it's, it's fantastic. Um, but the cappuccinos are actually quite average and I think that um, in some ways, we've been quite spoilt in London. Um, personally, I'm, I'm a complete coffee addict, and I think that's definitely the Italian in me. But um, my, my Italian friends and family are shocked when I say to them, I think the Antipodeans make better coffee than the Italians. You, you can't beat a flat white made by an Australian. And, and I think because we... Um, we have this incredible access to incredible food in London. We are spoilt, and so actually, when we go to very authentic places, and I mean authentic in terms of where people from that a particular country hang out, uh, they speak their language. It, it's really like a mini country. Uh, the the food can sometimes be disappointing if you're expecting something of really high quality, if you're expecting uh, to drink Monmouth coffee in an Italian social club, it's, it's not going to be like that, it's going to be an average cappuccino, but the, the cappuccino tastes better because you're in an authentic Italian environment, so I, I, I think that, that's re really interesting. Um, and, and so I think for us uh, in uh, at Shared City, um, we create authenticity in terms of uh, atmosphere and experience over food. But that said, I'm, I'm not saying the food you'll eat on our tours is terrible. It's, it's great, um, but... Um, it might not always be what you expect it to be, but we eat what the locals eat. Um, so, yes, I hope, I hope that's been an interesting insight. Um, and like, like I said, we are uh, developing um, uh, tours to uh, Thailand and Vietnam, but for us it's, it's not enough uh, to revolve the tour around a brilliant restaurant because um, anyone can do that so um, we, we need to find out where, where people go, where they hang out um, we, we have uh, um, 
very small group, so it's it's never more than 15 to 20 people. Um, some people, when they've given us uh, feedback, they've said, oh, well, you know, there were walking tours, say, around Shoreditch, um, and they're, I don't know, t 10 pounds for a walking tour. Uh, but the difference is that there might be 50 people on that tour, there's no limit, and uh, that tour stays outside, whereas because we're, we're, we're small, we get to sit in social clubs, community centres, we get to take part in, in very intimate uh, uh, celebrations or gatherings, and, and I think that's the difference, that, that provides the authenticity um, e even though our tagline is travel the world without leaving London, we want to get away from that sort of mass tourism of a guide with an umbrella and 50 people in the group. It's, it's a very intimate experience. So that's it. <laughs> Thanks for that, Deborah. It's really interesting that idea of sort of like disappointment that comes with the experience of the real thing. It's, it's, it's not always what you, what you want, but kind of what you need. Um, but um, just before I move on from you, you've got two tours this week as part of the festival. Well, oh, yes, two. I forgot. Yeah. I said <laughs> one. So on, on Tuesday, um, there's a trip. It's three till five uh, to the Islamic. Uh, cultural Centre, St John's Wood, um, and that's going to include a tour, a Q&A, and then tea and cake, which people don't associate with uh, um, Islam necessarily, <laughs> but yeah, we're having tea and cake there. Um, and then um, next Friday, and this is uh, to tie in with uh, Diwali, uh, we've got uh, a tour to um, uh, southern India, um, which takes place in East Ham, and the guide is brilliant. She grew up in the area, she's really passionate about her culture. She'll take you to an incredible temple, talk about Hindu architecture. You go on a shopping trip, that's what I forgot to say. We, uh, the guide takes people shopping, so if they are foodies and they want to buy authentic ingredients, we, we go to the authentic shops where people from the communities do their, their shopping. And uh, then, yes, the tour finishes off with a, a vegetarian tarly. Yeah, it's, it's so great to have a shared city as part of the festival. We've got these kind of two tours of Islamic London and Hindu London, yeah. um, both two kind of the major religious influences in the region of Southeast Asia. So come and experience those. <laughs> um, and now introducing our final speaker, um, Shuhan Lee, who is a graphic designer, uh, a cookbook author, um, and now a business student, among other things. So, <laughs> tell us about yourself. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my speech is going to be quite short compared to the rest of them. I'll see what I can build on what Andy, um, Song, and Deborah have said. Um, so, I'm writing a cookbook right now. Um, it's about Southeast Asian food. Um, but what's different about my book? is that it's using ingredients that you can find locally. So um, British seasonal produce, but Southeast Asian flavors. So um, that's going to make some people go like, man, I don't really want to buy that book. It's not going to be authentic. It's fusion. But that's what I'm going to, like, that's, that's what um, I really questioned in the book in the first place. What's the whole idea of authenticity? Um, there is a very signature dish in Singaporean and also Malaysian cooking called sambal kangkong. You probably know. Um, it's like really fiery sambal and um, morning glory or water spinach. Um, and the reason we use it a lot in, in Southeast Asian cooking is because it's so cheap. It basically grows by the drains. It's pretty much free. You can get a whole bunch for like 10p. If you, could do, if you try to find the same vegetable in London, it's about five pounds for, for a really small bag and it's not going to be fresh anymore it's not like it's flown halfway across the world it doesn't have the same flavor so why would you go out of your way trek i don't know how long it takes you to get to chinatown but it takes me quite a while to get to chinatown 
try all the way down to Chinatown, spend this much on a bag of greens that are not fresh anymore. Um, so in the book, I use, I suggested using chard or beetroot leaves or even um, um, older spinach because they've got crunchier stems and the leaves are still like similar, it's silky. So some people might say, oh, that's not really authentic, is it? But I think that it is because while growing up, my mom doesn't go to the market and go, yeah, I really want to get this vegetable because I need to make this dish. She goes and she sees what's fresh. She sees like what's like, she sees what's the best price being Asian. <laughs> and then <laughs> she buys it back and then she decides what she wants to do with it. And that's, I think it's the core of um, Southeast Asian cooking. Like it never was about um, recreating something exactly like um, like how your mom made it or how your grandma made it, but also making do with um, the ingredients that you can get and also um, adapting the dish to your environment. So um, Southeast Asian cooking in general, it's always been a mishmash of cultures. Like, um, uh, one of the most famous Singaporean dishes is chicken rice, Hainanese chicken rice. But funnily, you find that dish every, like throughout Southeast Asia. You find it in, in Thailand where it's called um, Khao Mang Gai, and then you find it in um, Vietnam where it's called Khom Ga, and then you've got it in Malaysia too, they made it into chicken rice balls, so they just roll the rice up in the balls. Yeah. And then you, so, so what, so what? What the dish was basically is when the southern Chinese immigrated from, from China years ago, they just moved to different parts of Southeast Asia and the locals picked up the dish. Um, well, the, the, the immigrants started cooking it more, but they started adapting it to the local ingredients and the environment that they got. So in, in Singapore, the, the sauces that you have with it are very different from what you get in, in Thailand or in, in Vietnam. In Vietnam, they use more herbs. In Vietnam, like like they serve with like a sweeter chili sauce. Um, but does that make the dish not authentic to the southern Chinese Hainanese chicken rice dish then? Well, I don't know. So, so it's, I, I, I sort of think authenticity has, um, brings in, I, I think it involves the concept of time also. Um, Singapore is actually a very young country. It's like 50 years old. So when you say something is an authentic Singaporean dish, it's only been created like in the past 50 years. Um, zi cha um, is a kind of style of cooking in Singapore where it's sort of like restaurant style, but in a, ho in a hawker center. So you've got chefs being really creative with what they've, what they've got. Um, Song mentioned like macaroni and, and spam being very like, like we regard it as a very Hong Kong dish now, Hong Kong breakfast dish. Um, and the zi cha chefs have this thing called cereal prawns, which is basically deep fried prawns with butter, um, uh, instant cereal, curry leaves, chili, and soy sauce and rice wine. So you've got the Chinese influences, Indian, Malay, and Western. So. And I don't know any Singaporean who would say that's not a Singaporean dish itself. But it's probably created only in like the last 20 years or so. Um, and it's definitely not authentic in terms of what um, maybe someone who's not very used to the culture and uh, used to food in Singapore would think. You might think, oh, okay, since so obviously your food, it has to be um, uh, rendang or like chicken rice. The, the, the stuff that you're used to. Um, and butter, butter in a, in a dish, in a Southeast Asian dish really? Do they even have cows? Yeah, so... Um, oh, and then uh, I just want to build on a point made by Deborah earlier, but I, I love what they do, um, bringing people um, to local communities and having um, local people lead the, like, um, lead the tours. Um, but I'm also wondering whether um, our idea of authenticity is always very skewed towards who is cooking something or who is leading a tour or who, like whose house is it and um, um, I've been to a restaurant with my friends before um, it was a Korean <coughs> restaurant and then they looked over and you're like ah oh, the chef looks Korean he must be authentic 
Which, which, which I admit I'm a bit guilty of, 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 of doing sometimes. I'll go to a Vietnamese place and I'm like, oh, if it's not really cooked by Vietnamese, I don't know whether I would say it's really authentic. But one of the most, um, one of the chefs that I respect the most, um, called Andy Ricker, he wrote uh, the book Pop Pop. Um, he's got um, the restaurant Pop Pop, started in Oregon and then, it, and then now it's in New York and a few other places. Um, he, he writes beautifully, his, his food, I've actually had it before, um, it's, it's, really, it's really good. It's, it's, I, I dare say sometimes that it's better than some of the experiences I got off the street in Thailand. Um, but, would I, um, but would somebody question the authenticity of um, his food just because he's not Thai? Just because he's, yeah. Um, yeah, well he's lived there 20 years. He's, he's, He's um, learned all he could from the locals and he's brought it back. But just but, but sometimes because of his background, people might question. Um, and he has to make replacements in re like replacements in his dish because you can't get all the herbs. You can't get uh, all the herbs, all the spices that you get back then. Eh? Um, and even if it was imported, it wouldn't have the same f same flavor and freshness. Um, but. Um, I do think I do I do think that um, his his food um, deserves to be caught and then um, yeah uh, actually that's it really I don't have that much more to say. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thanks to our four speakers for coming um, on a Sunday morning, giving up their for Sunday morning, and to you guys for coming to watch as well. Um, I suppose we'll now open to the floor if anyone has any questions for anybody. Uh, now's the time. Sorry, Aisha? <laughs> oh, it's not really a question, it's just an um, observation, really. But then I was getting so many, because I'm, I'm from the music department here, so I'm getting so many parallels with music, uh, sound station music. For instance, I was thinking, um, all this kind of business is not possible by Germany as well. I was really clear where the front drop is in Japan. And you raised the whole question of authenticity. Um, and there, there were times, many times at that time in the 90s, anyway, many singing in English, many times being authentic to British fans uh, from the 1970s. And what I sort of looked at the, the whole issue of authenticity, whether um, so from one viewpoint, you might say that that's very inauthentic or Indonesian. Compared with, but then you say, compared with what? Let, let's, for instance, compare with Gamelan. Now, Gamelan is thought to be very authentically Indonesian, but throughout the history of Gamelan, there's been immense um, change brought in from outside, from um, through the colonial period, through the post colonial period, through in, um, musicologists getting involved with it. it it's not. It shows a lot of change from outside. Whereas the punk scene in Japan is by and large homegrown and left to itself. So which one's more authentic, Gamelan or punk rock? And then many sort of parallels, I think, in the sort of that span. That's it, that wasn't really a question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Music, I think music and food are very interesting to consider. It's, it's it's quite interesting you mentioned that because when I've been around the world and sometimes you just randomly turn on the radio and um, there's rampant hip hop in local languages and, and again is that is, 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 is that not is that authentic or not because hip hop obviously isn't indigenous to them but they're well actually in most cases I haven't got a clue what they're rapping about but I'm assuming it's, it's about their lives and, and, and in which case it, it is authentic so I think there, there are many parallels there for sure. It's, it's very true. I've been reading a book about um, the uh, Port well, so-called Portuguese community in Malacca, um, in Malaysia, and um, and actually they were more than just simply um, uh, uh, Portuguese. Um, uh, you know, there was the Dutch and the British influences as well, but the Portuguese um, labels have sort of generally um, been attached to the, the Eurasians there, and, and and a lot of their performances and dance. Has actually sort of developed more recently, you know, over time, simply to kind of, in a sense, to kind of protect and 
um, I guess, differentiate them as a community from other um, communities within Malaysia and, and, and a lot for the performance to tourists. Um, and yet, you know, people say that that is authentic, but actually when you look behind the scenes, it's, it, it, you know, it wasn't necessarily the dance that they always had. Yeah, yes, yeah. Exactly, yes. Yes, there's a very good book all about it. I can't remember the title, but that's it. Yes, yes. And, um, and, and I think that just goes to show that I think that it comes down to me, authenticity, is actually what I think some scholars call um, existential authenticity, you know, which is actually about you know, who we are as people and persons, and, and everybody is individual, and, and, and just as, um, you, know, uh, you know, if you are being authentic and true to yourself and your experiences and your family upbringing and your region and, you know, whatever, um, that has influenced that, then I think that that, to me, is, is, is a <coughs> crucial thing. And I just wanted to very quickly, if I may, just pick up um, Shu's point about um, the um, who is cooking yeah. as well, which is interesting. And, and it is true, actually, sometimes it is, in my experience, who is cooking is so important. I mean, um, somebody from Penang um, cooking charcoal chow you know, there's something, something they just know how to cook it, which is a, a, a particular noodle dish. And I remember going into the um, hare and tortoise um, down at um, yeah, Brunswick Centre, and I had the charcoal chow there once, and I thought, wow, this has really got that nice kind of slight char and spice to it. I thought, and I said to the guy, I said, did a Malaysian chef cook this? And he said, yes. And I said, is he from Penang? He said, yes. <laughs> you know, sometimes it does make a difference. Um, actually, what um, uh, I was reminded of when uh, she spoke about the uh, chef was that um, on, on one of our tours um, uh, to, to Little Italy, which is Clerkenwell, um, a lot of people think it's Soho, it, it, it is actually Clerkenwell. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, guy, the Italian guy who runs a social club uh, was going to uh, come and talk uh, to to our group, and and he said, well, if I'm not around, um, I'll, I'll get uh, uh, one of the other uh, regulars to to come and talk to you, and um, and anyway, he he wasn't there, and so he he uh, had, had arranged for uh, this guy to come and, and talk to us, um, and the first thing that came out was that he was Austrian and not Italian, uh, but the thing is, he'd been part um, of the Italian community um, in London for about 40 years. Um, he even spoke English with a slight Italian accent, I think, you know, because he's been hanging around there um, for so long. And he could, he could talk about like, everything, about the history of Italians in Clerkenwell, and, and uh, uh, for me, that was authentic, and I, I think it was what um, Andy's saying, that it is about the person and about their, their, their passion. I mean, so what if, it, if he's not Italian? He is part of that community. They've adopted him, um, and while he was talking to us, everyone was coming up to him, patting him on the back, hugging him, saying, this man knows everything. He's a life and soul of this place. So... You, you can't argue with, with that. I mean, you, you know, we could have easily had someone from Rome who, uh, talking about the club, who is maybe less passionate. So, yes, I, I think it is all about the, the person at the end of the day, and they don't necessarily have to tick all the boxes. Okay. Just quick, quick one again, I'm always quick. <laughs> um, I think the whole problem with authenticity comes with, um, People, people having expectations and then it actually being a very personal thing. Yes. So because everyone also has different expectations and of, of how, how something is authentic, that clashes. Um, whereas it's, it's, it's always been, a, like what Andy mentioned, it's a personal experience. And then what um, Debra, the, the example Deborah gave about how um, the Austrian guy was as Italian as you, you could get. Um, yeah, so... Mm. Next question? 
Um, yeah, so um, an example I can give is with India. Um, I mean, uh, I think it's easy to forget that it's a subcontinent, it's m massive. The amount of languages that are spoken there, the amount of religions that are represented there, and you can't just have like one trip to, uh, to, to India. Um, so at the moment, we're, we're, we're uh, very clear with um, how we um, describe it all. So, for example, we have Gujarati India because the, um, uh, the, the tour that takes place in Alperton is representative of the Gujarati uh, community. Um, uh, uh, most people are vegetarian, um, even though they share Hinduism with other parts of India culturally that they're, they're quite different um, and a, a lot of people uh, from the Gujarati community ha have actually come to London via East Africa and not India so that their experience is very different so that's why we decided to um, uh, focus on different parts of India so uh, we've got the uh, uh, southern um, uh, Indian tour which takes place in East Ham and we're Kind of look, looking to e extend that and w we do a lot of, of research as well um, like, like I alluded to er uh, earlier um, it's not enough for us that oh there's a really good Thai restaurant there that there, there has to be more and we, we talk to people uh, we we really do our research and that that that's why we, we take our time because we do um, despite what I've, I've said about authenticity. We do want to recreate as an authentic experience as as, as possible. Um, but uh, yeah, though um, actually, what what is uh, interesting is that um, I think with what our experience has been of of some communities is that people might be from different parts of that country but actually when they're in London that becomes their focal point so you find that there are lots of uh, centres and uh, 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 temples uh, where um, or mosques even uh, where people um, from a particular country do uh, mix and have a, a shared experience here, whereas back home they might li live in opposite ends of the country. I don't know if that uh, that makes sense. Um, so, for uh, for example, with uh, one of the uh, mosques that we uh, go to, I can't remember off the top of my head what the, the exact name of the, the mosque, but the, the main community there is Iranian, uh, but there are lots of um, Muslims from uh, Eastern Europe that go there because it is their nearest uh, mosque. But actually, the overriding culture there is um, Iranian. So anyway, I hope that answers your question. Um, I so there's uh, Drummond Street, which 
has the, uh, like, also, um, restaurant, uh, is it Dilana? Um, yeah, no, there's, yeah, yeah, there's quite a few other yeah. Indian restaurants and other kind of, like, yeah. similar um, styles there. But, like, that's being threatened by, um, is it, uh, the, the new plans that they have for Houston. Do you find any of the communities that you're currently engaging with under threat? Um, due to either development or gentrification or any other uh, like things, like maybe it's an older community and then more and more of them are dying out and, and the young people are not really interested in engaging. How does yeah, you know, um, I suppose, uh, so um, we, we really want to do um, a multicultural tour in, in Brixton because there are so many different communities uh, represented uh, there. We are actually, we have, uh, um, well, we're about to launch a multi multicultural tour around uh, the East, uh, East End. Um, but I, I live quite close to Brixton and I'd love to do something there. But actually, I've been very aware of the gentrification of the area and the local people have become um, super sensitive um, and I don't know if any of you are aware but there's a big campaign actually run by my neighbour, it's called uh, Save Brixton Cycles and Brixton Cycles I think it's what it was uh, one of the first uh, um, uh, uh, like independent <coughs> cooperative uh, uh, shops in, in London. It's it's an incredible, there's a great team of people who work there and they've been uh, told to move because the shop that they currently occupy, which is between Brixton and Stockwell, um, is going to be knocked down and I don't know, they're going to build, okay. oh, God knows what, yeah, luxury <laughs> flats. Um, and so anyway, I, I'd, I'd love to go there, but... I think sometimes, especially a place like Brixton, where actually the local people, especially the people who run the, um, uh, who, who've been there for years and, and they've got their little shops there, I think they're very wary of people. And I think we we feel that we don't want, um, that that's something that we're very conscious of we, we don't want to be, uh, like, uh, you, you, we don't want to treat the community like it's a, a, a fishbowl and we're looking in, you know, that they're animals in the zoo. We really want to be part of it. And so, um, yeah, we just feel that maybe at the moment it's not the right place to, to do a touring because, you know, if, if you go to Brixton at the moment, everywhere you look, there are sort of posters saying stop gentrification. And even though we we are authentic and we want we'd like people to experience the real Brixton and, and the different communities there, uh, we are conscious that we will stand out. Maybe a group of people, you know, sort of walking around. Even though, like I said, we're we're we're, we're not a, a a massive group, so. Um, yeah, it, it, it's quite funny actually because I, I mentioned Brixton Cycles, and um, the the got one of the well, he he's one of the workers. Like I said, it's a cooperative. He happens to be my neighbour, and he's a, a born and bred uh, Brixtonite, whatever you call them. And um, I've begged him to to do the tour because uh, he's told me all all the gossip. You know, there's a big Portuguese community there. They're sort of more in, in Stockwell, but he, he told me that the, the majority of uh, the Portuguese are from Madeira and the Portuguese from mainland Portugal don't particularly like them and, you know, there's a bit of tension between them. You know, he told me all the gossip. He, he really understands the area and I've, I've begged him to, to be our tour guide. And, and he said, I, I would just be really bitter. I wouldn't make it a pleasant experience because I would just moan and grumble about the gentrification to the area. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, if I may, it, it's an interesting, I think it's a big debate about gentrification, but I think also about, you know, our notions again of, of, of authenticity in a sense, because the, the problem is, is that 
authenticity, um, the, the very word authenticity, um, you know, creates a rod for its own back in a way. Um, you know, it, it's almost how it, how is authentic is authenticity, um, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, and 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 places, you know, are constantly evolving. And I think one of the paradoxes of globalisation is is that on the one hand we are sort of standing against and, and fearful and quite rightly in, in many cases um, um, against this kind of um, homogenisation and standardisation of, of of life and you know experiences of, of life, whether it be retail um, or hotels or what have you. Um, whilst at the same time we're seeing increasing um, kind of differentiation as well um, as, a, as a kind of a perhaps a reaction against that um, you know so we see um, restaurants and, and supper clubs and cafes sort of focusing ever more on on a finite sort of very small narrow niche range of, of products and, and in London you know as the food culture has has kind of evolved over the last you know I mean I, I came back to London um, two years ago, having been um, in the in the north for ten years, and, and the, the the transformation in the food culture in, in London is is is, is phenomenal. Um, and, and you know now you can go to a cafe that focuses and is, is known for one particular dish. Well, in a way, we've sort of almost come round to what Southeast Asia does so well is that you know the street food, the the home cooking, um, the, but particularly the street food. You know, you know where you're going to get that absolutely brilliant nasi lemak or um, laksa or, or, or what have you, um, and, and and people will go, you know, drive or walk, well, more likely drive these days, um, <laughs> in their air-conditioned car as, as far as possible. You know, 40 minutes to go to the best um, satay grill or, or what have you um, in in the region, and so. Um, you know, it's so we kind of ended up with this situation where, on the one hand, we have this kind of very globalized, standardized, homogenized kind of brands and so on. Um, but let's face it, you know, we do like them to some degree. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing so well. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't be um, going as far as they would. Now, you know, the arguments around the fact that there is, you know, about capitalism and how the, the whole capitalist system works, but nevertheless. You know, people do like to have that little bit of familiarity, um, and even in cultures in Southeast Asia, there is this kind of, again, this strange kind of uh, dichotomy that people are, you know, loving having these brands. You know, to go to a Starbucks, you know, is so cool. You know, to get your frappuccino. You know, I mean, wow, we've got our first Starbucks in this city. Do you know what I mean? So I think I. I I think what I'm trying to get to is the fact that I think that you know in our postmodern globalized world, you know, things are evolving and, and cities are, um, are, are creative spaces and in many ways you know, people will find ways of making their mark, of making um, um, it their place, you know, no matter what. And and even if it means that over time we find gentrification of Communities, you know, the artist community in particular is a, is a classic example of how they tend to get pushed out of workshops. You're seeing it happen now under threat in Hackney Wick um, next to the Olympic Park. You know, there's a lot of debate around there about apartments coming in, um, in East London. And, um, and yet, you know, people will start to move out and they will find other kind of, you know, emerging other places and spaces in which to, um, to establish themselves. So, I'm kind of a little bit kind of perhaps I'm a bit on the fence about it, but I, I always tend to be air on the side of optimism when it comes to cities because I think you know cities you know have such a you know, centuries of, of change and and, um, and, uh, and evolution. Um, but whilst I think it is clearly an issue, it would be something that you know will perhaps be self rectifying over time. Maybe I'm just a bit too optimistic. But <coughs> Thank you to our panel. Um, it's been a really, really interesting, engaging debate. Um,
we've done it to death, maybe we can stand it. <laughs> but yeah, no, thank you, thank you all for coming, thank you everyone for giving up their, their Sunday morning. Um, and before I tell you to go, um, so we'd like to say we have something about a project that we're working on at the moment called My Southeast Asia, uh, which is an online um, kind of exhibition of people's <coughs> and reflections um, on what it is that Southeast Asia means to them. Um, so we'd love to get some feedback from any of you that are from Southeast Asia or have travelled there. Um, so photos or memories or anything, just uh, tweet it at us at the Sea Arts Fest with the hashtag My Southeast Asia. Um, and <coughs> just to spice it up a little bit, you can you could win a dinner for two at Rose's Thai Cafe um, by also tagging them in your tweet. Um, and the best kind of food related entry will yeah, win a dinner for two. So, thanks for the thoughts and thank you for coming.